case you don't know, Ignite Talk, Ignite is a format of short talks. So they're five minutes long. Each presenter has 20 slides, but the slides auto forward every 15 seconds. So you've got to know your talks really well. <laughs> There's a few nervous looking faces at the front. So they really need your support and encouragement. Uh, this is a fun event. We've got a real range of speakers covering a completely different set of topics. Um, and I think it's going to be really entertaining and really good fun. So I'm not going to talk too much today. I'm going to invite the first speaker up, who is David Kelly, uh, who's come all the way from New York. And he's going to talk about uh, wearable tech, as you can tell, probably tell from his face. Thank you. So do I kick it off? You can get started whenever you want. Well, first thing, a disclaimer, despite what you were told, uh, this session's not really going to be about wearable tech at all. Um, I am going to be talking about wearable tech, but the conversation around wear wearable tech is not about what, does the, what do these technologies do. It's about what can they do. So this session is less about the tech and more about the possibilities. We want to talk about what these, po what these technologies can do for us as learning professionals. And in order to do that, we've got to set a little bit of a baseline. So for that baseline, let's talk about what wearable tech really is. When you talk about wearable tech, most people define it in two ways. One, this weird thing I've got strapped to my head, or the, wear or the watches. But if you w I happen to have seen anything from the Consumer Electronics Show that went on recently, wearable tech has a much, much wider scope. At, at the Electronics Show, you saw things like goggles that skiers can wear that can direct them down the slopes and give them ideas about what the, where they can and cannot do, or footwear that tracks your movements and how quickly you're running. Wearable tech is expanding tremendously. We're seeing a lot of things around the wristbands that they don't just tell time or connect to your smartphone, but they're giving data about where you are, what you're doing, or with the press of a button, contacting people in an emergency, or clothing that can monitor a baby's heartbeat and temperature and give the parents who aren't paying attention to the baby some information about them. But I want to talk about this in the context of learning. And for me, wearable tech has three major impacts that apply to learning and how we can use them as learning professionals. And the first one is, where is wearable tech really impacting people? What is it doing? And the, and the real part of the body that is impacting is your hands. When you're dealing with something like Google Glass, like I'm wearing, it's most of the technology that's in here, I could do the same things with my cell phone. But it's not a matter of that, the, the technology itself. It's what's different about it. And the fact that you have your hands free enables you to do things you can't do with your cell phone, to demonstrate things that people could do that you can't do if you're actually holding a camera, and give people that first-person perspective. And it opens up new avenues for us as it relates to training and development opportunities. For one thing, you could do things that are very immersive. This is an example of a surgeon who is doing surgery and people who are less, the interns are in another room watching as he narrates his work. Very immersive in ways that we have never been able to do it before. You can take that model and flip it, and now it's a performance support tool where the expert's not the surgeon, the surgeon is actually the amateur. You don't want to be on the table, but if the surgeon's the amateur and the experts are watching, coaching the person along. Huge for performance support. Another option is training that we just can't really replicate in a classroom. This is someone who's repairing a cell phone tower. You can't appreciate being hundreds of feet in the air in a classroom, but with something like Google Glass, capturing that experience from that hand, from that person's perspective, it's very powerful. Another area that's important for learning is data. Wearable tech is going to expand what we define as data tremendously. Wearable tech, when, you're, when you have wearable tech, you're gonna see a lot of different things that's collecting data all the time. Everything that you're doing in some way is being captured. Every movement that you make, these are fitness apps that you wear on your arm. Every movement that you make becomes a data point. And when, the more data that you have, the more stories that you can tell. And stories are very important to us as learning professionals. I use Google Glass. One of the things that it's, it's tied into the Google ecosystem. So when I was home, before I got on, days before I came here, I was getting prompts about coming to London because Google knew that I was coming to London. Very contextual, and it starts being able to shape a story for us. And it starts building context. When we talk as learning professionals, everything is about context and making it relevant to people. And that's where this, this, this wearable technology is going to be very powerful for us. One of the examples that I can tell you is it's all about creating an experience. We want to create experience for, for people as learning professionals. And the wearable tech gives us the data and the context to tell great stories. A perfect example of this, I was recently in Florida with my family visiting Disney World. 
and Disney World has this new technology called Disney Bands, where you actually have a band that you wear. It's what you use to get into the park. It's what you use. You put it on a sensor when you make a purchase. It's got an RFID tag in there that is telling Disney where you are at all times. When you get it, you have to fill out a form online telling it a little bit about who, you're, who, who you are, who's coming with you giving data to Disney that helps shape the experience. So what does this wind up looking like as an experience? You're in Disney, you're walking around. Disney knows when you went to the park. It knows what rides you're going on as you scan through. It knows things about you. So Snow White walking around the park gets a little bug in her ear that says, there's a gentleman walking by, he's got a daughter, she's got red hair, she's about nine years old. She loves Snow White and it's her birthday. And Snow White walks over to my daughter and says, Lauren, it's your birthday, happy birthday creating an experience that is just unfathomable. So when I talk about te technology with wearable tech, it's about creating those experiences, huge possibilities for us, and I hope you explore it in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave, that was fantastic. Now, we're not actually gonna be doing questions at the end of each talk, but if you do have any questions, I would encourage you to come up and meet with the, each of the speakers afterwards, and they'd be happy to talk about anything you want to talk about. So next up, we have Martin Cousins. Martin is a journalist and professional digital curator of the LearnPatch site. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, showing what you know. When does it start? Can I introduce it first? OK, so you know it, so show it. I've got some great news for everyone here. Let's go. OK, so I've got 10 tips. And these 10 tips are all about you guys showing what you know. Because I think well, everyone here needs to be able to show what stuff they can bring to um, their personal and professional worlds. So first tip, identify what you know. Everyone here probably has a passion, an interest, an area that they could probably talk about. Now, there's lots of social tools out there for, to enable us to show all this great stuff that we have a passion for. I'm not gonna give you those tools, and I have hacked this slide deck, so you only get 10 images, by the way. Um, so the second point is identify others who know what you know. So the first thing is, what do you, what do you care about? What you got a passion for? Secondly, who else has got a passion for that? Because in our networked world, we want to identify other people who know what we know and see what, what they're saying, so we can compare with that. Then we need to look at who the audience might be. Is it our network, community? Um, are we building our own audience? So if it's knitting, then you probably, there's, there's, a, there's a massive knitting community online. So what do you bring to it? I don't know, you might use special needles, but you're gonna bring something to it, but you need to understand who your audience is first. Um, I'm going to just pause there because I've got plenty of time between slides because I just remembered that I've hacked it. So, now, this dude, a lot of thinking. You need to think about why people are interested in what you've got to say. As I said, I'm not talking about tools. I'm talking about the basics before you do anything to make yourself show what you know online. So, think about why those other knitters in the knitting community would be interested in what you bring to knitting because you probably do bring something quite special that's different to everyone else. Um, so we're halfway through, at which point we have to do this bit of algebra. Now, mash up the first four points, fill in the gaps. I know about whatever you're passionate about, and this group is the audience, so they're interested in finding out more about what I have to say. So, halfway through, you know what you've got to say, you know who you're going to say it to. So now we've got five points to help us get to doing something quite interesting. So use your tools to stay on top of your subject. There's plenty of tools online, social tools, to help you understand what's going on in your subject area. So what you need to do is use them to make sure you, you are in the know because there aren't many people that do this kind of thing, so it wouldn't take a lot for anyone here to start doing this and to start to look like they know a lot more than other people. Does that sound good? It should do. Um, now, stay up to date with what others are saying. Technology has moved on from this dude who used to shout the news, so you've got, you must stay up to date with your topic. 
you've got to be relevant. So relevant equals useful. You're going to start using these tools to make sure you know what's going on in your world. OK? Because if you do that, your audience and your community and your network come back to you. You then need to work out how you're going to share it. So I, I would imagine, is everyone on LinkedIn here? Yeah? Well, that might be a place to do it. It might be blogs. It might be on Twitter. It might be a whole range of places that you might share what you know. But you need to understand your community, your network, and where they are. And then you can start doing it in the way that will actually find, they, they would find it useful. And then, because it's all so connected, you're going to carry on talking to those people about what you're doing and what they think about what you're doing. Because this is how it works. It's not just broadcast, it's conversation. And you've probably built a community around a topic or an interest, and you need to start being generous with your time, and they'll start being generous with their time, and together, you're going to build some authority, and you're going to deepen your understanding of your topic area. Finally, because you're going to be doing this online, there are a whole host of tools to measure what you do. So you need to bring some understanding to all this new stuff you're going to do to show what you know and bring credibility to your professional work or personal work. Um, but you need to have an understanding of whether it's working. So you would use some tools to see whether your influence has grown or, or you've got more people in your community. Um, and then you can tweak what you're going to do. And then that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. That was fantastic. Um, so, moving on to our next speaker. Well, before we do move on to our next speaker, uh, I just want to let you know about something else that we're doing. Uh, if you look towards the back, uh, you'll see the, there's one cameraman, uh, but there's also a gentleman sat down, looking very studious and busy. Uh, Alexi, give us a wave. Hello. Now, Alexi filmed the first talk, and he's working hard right now to turn that piece of video content um, into something usable, into a usable learning uh, object. And we did this yesterday, because it's the second time we've run these. And he actually managed to do it before the talks had finished yesterday. So we think Ignite's, the Ignite format is a really interesting tool for us as learning professionals, because it forces you to present something in a very succinct and visual way. And you can use that as a way to create content really effectively and really quickly. So we're kind of uh, showing what we know today by doing that. Uh, so. Next up, Depesh, Depesh Mystery from East Midlands Police, and he's going to share a really inspiring story about his journey to where he is today. Thank you. I'm just going to pop this up. Okay, cool. Is that connected to the internet? Uh, are we on the internet? That? No. No, that's not. It's not. No, it doesn't need to be. I thought it was. Ah. That's fine. I can take that off if you like. Okay. Um, we can plug it in. I don't know if it's going to connect with no, it. That's probably fine. not. Probably not. That's too important. Yep. Yeah, okay. let's go with it. Okay. Slight change of order there. Uh, I wasn't in charge of that. <laughs> um, instead, we're going to have Owen come up instead. Now, Owen has been very kindly agreed to do two for us. So he came here yesterday, so he's had one extra practice. Uh, and he's going to tell us about the baloney detection kit. definitely going to be my slides, yeah? <laughs> I'm ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about baloney. But before I get right into the meat of that, I want to um, tell you about a hero of psychology that doesn't get nearly enough attention in learning and development. In 1948, a psychologist called Bertram R. Forder um, gave a personality test to his students. He told them that each and every one of them would receive a unique personality analysis based on the test results. When he gave them the results, he asked them to score the analysis on a score of zero to five on how well it described them, with zero being poor and five being absolutely perfect. Now, the the analysis, the students gave an average score of 4.25 out of 5. 
So almost perfect, right? Incredibly accurate personality assessment. But in reality, every single student received exactly the same analysis. And Forer had put it together by copying statements from horoscopes. I'm sure that you can think of some business tools that work in roughly the same way. Seemingly credible, but inherently flawed. And there are some examples, these are just some examples of what I mean by baloney. So I'm using the term baloney to refer to the, the many different types of deception to which we are all susceptible. Um, it's the common, popular, pseudoscientific claims that worm their way into business life. And falling for these fictions it doesn't make us stupid. It doesn't make us bad people. It just means that we need to equip ourselves with the tools to fight against them. So here are some key warning signals to watch out for. Whenever someone uses the term, whenever someone uses this term um, without providing the source of the research, that's when you should beware. Because it might mean that the information is second or third or fourth hand. It might mean that the person telling you about the research hasn't actually read it themselves. But incidentally, this is the reference for the Forer Effect paper. More can be found out about it on Wikipedia. Um, and it's been replicated hundreds of times. So that's, that's good research. Um, whenever you hear a complex idea or human process boiled down into a nice pithy phrase or a few numbers, that's another time when you should be watching out for baloney. Oversimplifying is, it's, a, it's attractive, but ultimately pointless. So ideas like communication are too complicated to boil down into a chart. Um, human personality doesn't fit into 16 neat little categories. Um, if it all seems like suddenly things have got really simple, then you're probably dealing with baloney. This is my favorite, um, because we all love a common sense explanation for things. But there's a small problem with that, because quite often, complex processes have counterintuitive explanations. Our common sense evolved in a time in a world when we hunted and we gathered. So when someone says, if this is the case, then it's just common sense that that must also be true, alarm bells should start to ring. I, um, I love a story as much as the next person, but stories didn't discover the link between cancer and smoking. In fact, stories delayed action upon it because everyone knew a counterfactual story to the overall general trend. Everyone had a family member who smoked all of their lives and lived until they were 412. And so stories are great for winning over hearts and minds, but for that very reason, they can't be the only source of credibility that we look for for an, an idea. There's an ingrained um, human trait to pay more attention to evidence that supports a personal viewpoint than evidence that contradicts it. So let's say that I make a claim that the most creative companies in the world give their staff time to work on personal projects that have nothing to do with their main job. And I point to Google and say, well, they've got 20% time. And I point to 3M and say they have a 15% rule. And I can give you historical examples like Edison's Menlo Park Lab. But what's missing from that brilliant story is all the examples of the organizations that implement something similar and get no more creative. All the counterfactuals, all the missing, the missing part of the iceberg. So great ideas go through a rigorous process of challenge and they come out of that challenge stronger as a result. If the evidence supporting a new technique or a concept seems to be cherry picked um, or a bit overly simplistic, it's worth looking out the contradictory evidence yourself. Now, none of this is to say that when you see those warning signs that you are in the, in the presence of baloney. They're just a cue to ask more questions and seek confirmation. And I hope that everyone will do a little bit more of that as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, I am ever, ever so grateful for Laura because she saved me from uh, having to pull together an Ignite talk with like one day's notice. Unfortunately, someone dropped out uh, on Monday and we made a, a, a silly suggestion that Dan and I might actually pull together one in time for this. Fortunately, I bumped into Laura yesterday after she did her session here and said she was about to do an Ignite talk upstairs 
and offered very kindly to step in at the last minute. So I am ever so grateful to Laura Overton from Towards Maturity to uh, come up and do the next talk. She's an absolute lifesaver. So give her a big round of applause, please. The only trouble was that I actually didn't do the Ignite upstairs, so I haven't practiced either, so <laughs> please bear with me. <laughs> okay. Because what I'd like to talk to you about is how to, how to engage disengaged learners. But what I'd like to do is to share with you some evidence that will help you challenge your assumptions about learners in your organization. As an organization, we've been doing work with learning and development professionals for the last 10 years to find out what it is that they do well with technology. But 44% of us actually think our biggest barrier to change and getting adoption is learner reluctance themselves. So that started making us think as an organization. That's what L&D people think, but what do learners think? And so over the last year, we've been conducting our learning landscape study where we've been going out directly to learners, all kinds of them, to find out how they learn how to do the job that they do. And that's given us a number of different insights about what's important to them and what's not. Funnily enough, top at the list of what, how they learn is through communication, through, through a collaboration. But the course is not... Um, dead for the learner. In fact, 60% um, of learners still want to go on a course, but self-paced learning is really important to them. And they're actually not that disinterested in actually engaging with online learning. Equally, contrary to popular belief, they're not that disinterested in sharing knowledge with each other. And in fact, nearly 84% of them are saying that we're very happy to share what we know with other people. We might need a little bit of help. But when you ask the learning and development professional, you know, about learning and connecting and collaboration, only one in five of us actually think that our staff have got the ability to be able to connect and share with each other. So there's a real mismatch in what we think about um, our learners versus what um, the learners are actually doing for themselves. So if we want to engage disengaged learners, I think we need to start thinking, are they reluctant or are they reluctant to engage with what we are doing? So when we ask the learners directly themselves, what's stopping you from connecting and engaging with, with online learning? It's not time, which most of us think in a learning and development profession. It's things like content. It's just uninspiring. They're bored. They can't find what they need. And these are all things that we can actually do something about. If we take uninspiring content, for example, already Owen and a number of people have said, you know, we should be using stories. Dave was saying that as well. Get them emotionally engaged. But ourselves, we actually don't even think our learning's relevant to people anyway. So we're not surprised that they're uninspired. And who does inspire them anyway? Well, actually, only 7% think that us in the learning and development profession. But the managers themselves are the ones that get people engaged and connected with content. And also, the other thing that's important to learners is the fact that they're actually very hungry for recognition and engagement with their process. But as learning and development people, only one in five of us provide any kind of recognition to individuals when they get involved with online learning. This perhaps is something we can do something about. Equally, none of us really are actually connecting directly with line managers. We're rolling out programs, but we're not supporting the managers and equipping them to help embed that learning back into the workplace. That's something we can do something about. Place is important to learners, but the learners themselves are getting around it. 62% are using some kind of technology to access resources that they've found in order to do their job better. 50% of them are actually doing, using their own technology to do that. And yet, as learning and development professionals, only 15% of us are actually providing that opportunity. So is there something that we can do here to help people? Now, the third um, big barrier for learners is the fact that they just can't find and can't see what it is that they need. The 52% of them think their company clearly communicates with them, which is interesting given the fact that actually only 44% of learning and development departments actually have any kind of communication plan around our programs. So that what's really interesting about that is we spend all of our life creating and designing the most amazingly and beautiful things, and then we put them in a small box, often called a learning management system, hidden away from view. So we need to start communicating some of those areas. 
And what we found in our research is that top learning companies are doing more of all of these things. And you can actually download the research credits, actually will be at the end of this, to be able to draw on what those top learning companies are doing. But more importantly, when they start acting in those areas that we've just been talking about, they're getting better engagement consistently across the board. And we've been doing this study really for, three, um, for 10 years now with 3,000 people. So we can provide for you some information and some data. But you, if you're going to be a successful organization to engage your learners, you have to take insights from this that challenge your thinking and turn them into actions that you need. So do come and see us on stand 179 after this if you'd like access to this research. I'll just pick up the infographic. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Laura. That was fantastic. Now, uh, Dan is just going to make sure we've got Depeche's slides ready to come up next, um, uh, because it's not fair to keep you waiting any longer. <laughs> uh, so if, if you're interested in finding out more about Towards Maturity, I would urge you to take one of the uh, leaflets from the ladies at either side. If you stick your hand up, and they'll happily hand them over. Um, so. Ignite is not just uh, you know, something that we're doing here. It's something that happens around the world. Uh, if you're interested in, in actually going along to an Ignite event, you can find them in London, Bristol, Cardiff, and Liverpool. And you get a really wide range of talks. There's some really interesting stuff on there. You may even want to go along and do one. Um, and Ignite's a really good way of uh, developing your presentation skills. Uh, I work for an insurance company uh, in my day job. And we've actually been using the Ignite format as a way of training presentation skills. So, um, it's great, as we've seen from the slides today, you get really visual slides, um, really great slide design from everyone we've seen today, and I know the same applies to the ones we've got coming next. So it's a great way to help people learn how to present in a more succinct fashion, um, use good visual design principles, and um, it can become a really useful communication tool, I think, for um, a lot of things that happen in some large businesses. So, are we ready, Dan? <laughs> Fantastic. Yep, no worries. So this is Dipesh Mystery, and uh, he works for East Midlands Police, and he's going to share his very uh, inspiring story of how he's uh, came to be in the role that he's in today. Just give him a second to get himself started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tepesh Mystery, and today I'm going to talk, demonstrate to you the value of paper. Yep. First of all, can I get a volunteer, please? Anybody? A volunteer out the audience? Yes, young lady out the back there, if you can come to the front before slide 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first question to you is, what is the value of paper? If you can text in your answers, to the number provided around, um, I would be very much grateful. It will not be used for any marketing purposes whatsoever. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started my career at the age of 15 as a waiter, earning three pounds an hour, running up and down the stairs. Really, really enjoyed it. Within my first year, I was promoted to restaurant manager whilst I was still studying my A-levels. So I went off to university, studied computer-aided product design, absolutely fantastic, was doing really well. Just happens to be I couldn't continue. So I left university with no formal qualifications and started work in a call center for a global brand. I was top salesperson on the floor throughout the first two, three years that I was there. However, it wasn't enough for me, so I went out and bought my first house at the age of 21. A new challenge for me. Really something to bring something out of me. However, it just happens to be, I lost my job. So, what did I do? I went out and started working as a driver. Yes, driver. I had no formal qualifications. So, working between 70 to 80 hours a week, just to pay the bills. So. After 70 to 80 hours a week, I finally got promoted. I'd like to think I looked more like that after 70 to 80 hours. Um, and I was promoted a couple of times within the company. However, I reached a certain point where I realized without any qualification, 
I can't get anywhere. Without a specialism in something, I can't get anywhere. So I like to think of myself as a jack of all trades. However, the common joke always is, you're a master of none. So I realized I needed to find a specialism in that one something. However, still having all those strings to my bow to be able to do everything. So I kept, went out and got myself a CIPD qualification in training. And other qualifications are also available. For example, to add that credibility, if you want to become an accountant, I'd recommend you go out and get your ACCA. If you want to become a plumber, you go out and get a gas safe certificate that really adds credibility to your work. So what, does 2013, what did 2013 bring for me? I landed a new job within the first three months of starting the qualification. I hadn't even completed the qualification at this point. I landed a new job and I was work now I'm working for the East Midlands Police Force and the Learning and Development Project Design Officer. A little bit less glamorous than that, may I add, but we do get the best toys. <laughs> so I now look forward to my job. I walk in Monday mornings really inspired by what I do and inspiring everybody around me. I get the opportunity to do what I do best how, in however way I can. So I'm just going to call this young lady over to the front now. I'm going to demonstrate to you the value of paper. What I'm going to do is give you a piece of paper. You've got the opportunity to either fold it up, put it in your pocket, or rip it up and chuck it on the floor. Uh, rip it up. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to do for you now is give you the noisiest piece of paper. As you can tell, it is the noisiest piece of paper. You can either fold it up, put it in your pocket, or rip it up and chuck it on the floor. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate to you the value of paper. I'm going to give you just another piece of paper. It's just another piece of paper. You can either fold it up, put it in your pocket, or rip it up and chuck it on the floor. <laughs> My whole point in this story is that it's not about it's just another piece of paper. Your GCSEs may just be another piece of paper to you, but at the end of the day, it will help you and this sort of paper future, in future life. I've got a quote from Gandhi up there, live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. The whole moral of that is you can never be too old to learn anything. I'd like to thank you for your time today. And he's even clearing up after himself. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so um, we're just going to quickly swap over the slide decks again, and I'm going to welcome John Curran up to speak next. Uh, John Curran is... Um, uh, an e-learning guru, I would say. Uh, are you vice chair of the e-learning network now as well? Yeah. Wow. Authority as well as uh, guru status. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming and staying. That's hard act to follow, that last one from the Pesh. I love that. I wish somebody gave me a fiver every day. Okay, let's go. Okay, in the next five minutes, I'm going to share a business idea that should appeal to any, anyone working in L&D. Teaching sells. It's a great concept because it lets you make money while indulging in your passion. And you also get to make the world a better, more enlightened place. Oh dear, the technology's gone wrong already. Sorry about that. <laughs> So where do we go to learn? We go to learn today. We go to the library, the classroom, the internet. No, we go to Google. The landscape of, of learning is uh, the landscape of increasing demand and changing needs to create a massive demand for learning, just in time, not just in case. And the only effective way to meet this demand is to learn online. We are awash with information. Oh, sorry, I do apologize. Well, so is looking up on Google actually learning anything? 
we're a wash of information, but 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 making sense of it all, knowing what's relevant and what's not relevant, is a real cha is a real challenge. Research shows that the internet is even affecting the wiring of our brains. The longer we're really good at storing away those facts that we bring to, bring up bring up at the local at the pub quiz. To help us make sense of it all, we need a teacher. We need a guide. We need people like Mr. Cloakson, my maths teacher, who helped me appreciate the practice of, math of, of mathematics, if not the actual beauty. But we can't rely on old school teachers like Mr. Cloakson. We, the, we need people who know stuff to teach other people stuff. Whether we tweet, curate, write a blog, or make videos, we are all teachers now, or at least we have the potential to be. Alongside learning, teaching, will be the ultimate 21st century skill. Not teaching the old way, standing up in the classroom, but telling people stuff, and telling people stuff, but being their online guide. Whether you blog, make videos, write books, or run webinars, your ultimate value in 2020 will depend on how good your teaching skills are. With so much learning and teaching to be done, the old model is too expensive and inflexible. It can't keep pace with today's demands. Mind the gap. In future, all learning will be online. You all know stuff, and what you know has real value. You can package and sell that stuff. In the next two minutes, we'll look at the seven steps to your first online class, or in the words of an entrepreneur, our minimum viable product. Step one, find your niche. This is key. Get to the root of your passion, knitting or whatever. Be an expert in a very small pond. Codify what you, know, what you really know. Only then can you share it with others. It's what we call the long tail of learning. Step two, research the market. Decide how much your knowledge is worth and how much someone will pay for it. Five pounds, 50 pounds, 500 pounds. Do the math. It isn't hard to work out why e-learning is so popular with teachers and learners alike. Step three, design the learning. Get your creative juices flowing. Act it out, write it down, talk it through, involve others, test assumptions. Above all, take a pedagogical approach. Focus on the stuff that people really struggle with, the sweet spot of learning. Step four, assemble a learning pathway. Write a script, develop a storyboard, shoot a video, set an assignment, find good stuff that's already out there. Join the dots, get your curator's hat on. Decide if your learners need support from you or from other learners. Step five, prepare the classroom, rent an LMS, start a MOOC, create an app, upload your course to Udemy, make it mobile friendly. If your learners need support, will you be their e-tutor? Step six, price and promote. If your learners can't find your brilliant course, your income stream will be less than stellar. And the same goes if they can find it, but can't afford it. Think like an app developer. Lots paying $4.99 is better than a few paying $49.99. Step seven, tempt them in. Break your stuff into connected pieces. Give the first piece away free. Package your stuff to create bargain bundles. Bog off, buy one, get one free. Applies as well to learning as it does to donuts. What your learners really want is the distillation of everything you know, contextualized precisely for them. In a nutshell, less is more. But getting to that less is your key challenge as a newbie, online, teacher, entrepreneur. Once you find that sweet spot, milk it for all it's worth. Write a book, even better, write a series of very short books. Make a video, hit the speaking circuit. Hell, consult if you must. Knowledge is the only thing you can give away but still keep. Finally, bask in your guru status, knowing you have passed on your wisdom to others. Forget the wisdom of crowds. Focus instead on the wisdom of one. It's your insight thereafter. Teaching does pay. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, just looking around, but I think that is the end of our talks. That's the last one. So thank you, everybody who spoke today. Can we have one big round of applause for everyone? It takes an awful lot of effort and even more uh, guts to stand up here and do one of those.